Burnout has always been a problem for healthcare workers for whom long hours and stressful days are just part of the job. But, of course, the pandemic has made everything that much harder. And in response, doctors, nurses and other medical staff have been leaving the field at alarming rates. It's also pro prompted a wave of unionization efforts among those left behind, including here in Boston. At Mass General Brigham, the healthcare network behind Brigham and Women's and Mass General Hospitals, among others, residents, fellows, and interns have signed their support for a union. And because Mass General Brigham has refused to voluntarily recognize them, organizers are looking ahead to formal election overseen by the National Labor Relations Board. The effort has gotten backing from city leaders like City Council President Ed Flynn and City Council Ruth Z. Luisian who have joined residents, fellows, interns, and union advocates to show their support. Councilor Luizhen joins me now, along with Dr. Sasha Murillo, internal medicine resident at Mass General Hospital, and one of the leaders behind the unionization efforts. So I should note, we also reached out to invite a representative from Mass General Brigham to join us. They declined. They did send a statement instead, which I'll get to in a little bit. Welcome to both of you. Doctor, I want to start with, with you first. Can, can you tell us what the issues are that you're facing that you feel are not being addressed, so therefore you're looking at a union? Absolutely, uh, and thank you for having me here today. Um, you know, I think a lot of the challenges that we face as residents in the healthcare system are pretty universal across the country. Um, we are, you know, we work long hours. We work 80 plus hours many weeks uh, in the year. We often face, um, you know, poor working conditions. I know many of my colleagues have spent a night on a, a yoga mat on the floor and have had, haven't had access to call rooms when we're doing 24 hour shifts. Um, and then there are, you know, your benefits and salary. We live in one of the most expensive cities in the country um, and struggle to pay our rent when we're saddled with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Um, and, you know, are also foregoing, you know, earnings in other fields and don't have access to retirement benefits, um, much like other people our age in other industries. So, so, so those so are just some of the things. So, Doctor, as I'm, I'm kind of parsing through this and reading some comments and talking to older doctors and older people in the healthcare world, some of them are saying, look, at this is just how it is. This is how it's always been. None of us got any sleep while we were residents. All of us have lived in Boston, which has always been expensive. Why is it different for your generation, they might ask? I think that, you know, uh, I think that when we say just we've done something one way, we should always question why. And is this really the way that we need to continue doing things? I myself am uh, training to be a primary care doctor actually in this city. And most of my training is spent in the hospital because I know that that is where the hospital makes the most money from my labor, is by me staffing their inpatient units, their in critical care units. But really, you know, I think that we need to rethink residency training and who is it really for? Is it for the hospital or is it for us? This is uh, the response that we got from MGH Brigham. Uh, they sent this to us earlier today. While we share the common goal of offering a world-class, comprehensive, and supportive medical education experience, we believe we can achieve the best results by working together in direct partnership rather than through representatives in a process that can lead to conflict and potentially risk the continuity of patient care. We are committed to continuing our dialogue with our trainees and building on a number of achievements, including market-leading increases in compensation, retirement savings, and health care. Counselor, what, what's your response to, to that response, that statement from, uh, from the hospital? Well, I actually think the good doctor said it the best way. Well, we're, these doctors have been in doctor trainees, residents, interns, fellows, sacrifice a lot for patient care. I don't see any way that supporting a union is disruptive of the continuity of care for our patients. If anything, it helps to preserve and ensure that we are giving the best care possible to our patients because doctors are well rested. Doctors feel like their employer cares for them. Like we benefit everyone when we stand in solidarity with workers, whether they're doctors or folks who work at the local convenience store. Unions are there to fill that gap when employers aren't centering the needs 
and the desires of workers who are really an important part of uh, making sure that we are being efficient in that patient care. So I would just disagree and support the dedication and commitment of these doctor trainees in organizing and in fighting for their union. Councillor, what, what are you seeing around the city regarding union organizers and organizations? You know, we're in a, an odd place in the United States where the power of unions nationally seems to have decreased and union membership has decreased. And, you know, my dad was a, a teamster in the 1960s and my mom was a shop steward. And I don't think I know anybody who is, is in a union, having grown up surrounded by people in unions. Yet, we see a younger generation of people, both doctors and Starbucks workers and folks all around the city, trying to get the unions back up and being helpful again. What's, what's your take of what's happening? Yeah, first of all, Boston is a union town. And we are here to stand in solidarity with our workers. I think it's really important that we say, you know, whether they're doctor trainees, like I stated, you know, folks who have, you know, spent a significant amount of time in school and are now out there to become doctors, or whether you are a nursing assistant or a janitor at the hospital, we need to make sure that we are filling and standing in that gap so that workers aren't subject to the the, to the whims of corporate greed. And so it's important that we stand in that gap. And it's not just happening in the city of Boston. We see it happening with Amazon. We see people realizing that if we are not standing up for ourselves, then we're just railroaded. So it is important that we stand with workers and that we stand with workers' ability to unionize so that folks can have living wages, family sustaining careers, benefits, and that they are able to retire with dignity. And we all need rest. None of us are just meant to be cogs in a wheel or widgets. We are people who require rest. And you know, the good doctor also said, just because something's been done one way, does that mean, does not mean that's how it must always be done. I am a lawyer by training. There are certain things that I did as a, as a lawyer in my training to having taken the bar that I think we need to redo so that the next generation doesn't have to put up with the same challenges. We need to make sure that we are infusing more compassion into our systems. And you do that with unions. Unions recognize that workers are people and humans who deserve to be valued when systems sometimes just see individuals as cogs in a wheel. And so I stand um, incredibly with our interns and our fellows who have taken the ex uh, extreme example what we see now of courage and dedication. They're already working so many hours a week and on top of that, they are organizing. And I just wanna say, my sister organized her workplace with the Teamsters last year. So the Teamsters are still around and they're still kicking, so. <laughs> Dr. Mario, I, wa I wanna ask you a, a couple of pushback questions uh, from, from folks I've talked to and some research I've done. People are concerned. I mean, I, I can't even get into the idea of working Doctors working an 80-hour week and then telling us that we shouldn't be working an 80-hour week definitely falls into the practice what you preach situation. And any of us who have looked in the eyes of a doctor who we know have been working more than, you know, 60 or 70 hours in an emergency room does not make me... I know how stupid I get at the end of the night when I haven't had a lot of sleep. But nonetheless, uh, if we agree that... Um, those hours are too much. There's concerns that that would change the entire shape of a residency program, that that will not give you enough time to learn what you need to do to be a very good doctor. What's your answer to that? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I would like to push back on that on a few, in a few different ways. I think one, there's one respecting the limits that we've set forth. Sometimes there are uh, individuals who, um, you know, the ACGME, which is sort of the accrediting body of a residency program, sets an 80 hour work week limit. Uh, and yet many, many people in some surgical specialties, for example, will go beyond that and will under report their hours. And so we're asking, you know, that we just sort of at least respect the limits that we set forth. That's, I think, number one. One. And then two, I think it's like, as you said, are we, how much are we learning if we are, you know, burnt out at the end of an 80 hour work week? Um, and at some point, you know, so much of our work is a lot of, uh, you know, is leading to burnout in fields beyond residency and uh, at levels beyond residency. We're dealing with a lot of paperwork, a lot of prior authorizations to try to get our patients the medications that they need. We're dealing with a lot of other systemic barriers that um, are also, you know, impacting our education already. And so, you know, I, I think that the 80-hour work week is really just sort of like an arbitrary um, 
determinant of uh, how much education we're actually getting, and the quality is what matters. What about the issue of who, who pays for it? So um, if we all agree that you should be paid more, and we live in a country where we're all paying for our own health care one way or another, where, where would the cost get absorbed for paying more for uh, residents' work? I think that can be answered on a few levels. I think that clearly our hospital system has the resources to do this. Um, you know, just under the threat of a union, they were able to find the money to be able to offer us a ready salary raises for the next year and other increased benefits. But I think on a larger scale, you know, the federal government has underfunded residency for many years. We have not increased the number of residency spots, I think, since the 80s. And so uh, in a country where our healthcare needs are getting more and more complex by the decade. Uh, and so that has not changed for many years. And I think ultimately another answer needs to come from above as well. So uh, as I, uh, folks who watch the show or pay attention to me know, we are, my family uses healthcare a lot. I've got a kid with a chronic illness. We have at least three doctor's appointments a week. It is hell trying to get appointments. She's had three primary care doctors in two years. People are leaving. Um, uh, and just the administrative folks who are trying to do their best to get appointments, it's a nightmare, right? And this is at in Boston in one of the, the greatest hospitals in the world. Doctor, what, what's, what's your statement about are you feeling like you're in a position of power because of the retirements and the burnout that you, you're hoping that this leverage will allow you to get what you want without having to go to a union or do you think the union is the path that you're going to take? I think the union is the path that we need to take. It's the only path where we can ensure that these benefits will live on in perpetuity. Um, it's the way that we feel that we have agency. And, you know, when we're faced with burnout, we feel empowered when we have, when our voices are respected. Uh, and, you know, I, I take issue actually with a part of this, many parts of the statement, but in particular, the statement that um, I think uh, that MGB put forth that suggests that there is some kind of interloper that sort of, negotiates our contracts. We are the union. The residents form the union. We're we're asking for a direct partnership as a union. And I think we think that that is the most effective way to make sure that our voices are heard and to use this platform to really advocate for our patients as well. We're the ones on the front lines along with nurses, PCAs. We see the issues day to day and so many decisions come from the top down. Uh, and we really feel that this is our platform where we can raise some of those issues uh, across the system. Councillor, uh, one of the underpinnings of this conversation, too, is housing and how much and how expensive it is to live here in this city, wanting to attract world-class people to work at a world-class hospital, and they can't afford, even with a good salary, maybe not enough, but still a good salary, you can't afford to live here. Um, does the city council, when you're dealing with corporations and hospitals and the uh, colleges here quickly. Uh, does this come into play that we've got to do something about housing if we want to keep people coming here and working here and living here? Absolutely. It's a, it's a question that we deal with all the time. It is that we are the second most expensive city to rent. You have to make more than $180,000 if you want to purchase a home in the city of Boston. Um, it is something that we are grappling with. More than half of the city's allo uh, allocation from the federal government are offer dollars. We, we allocated more than $200 million to housing, uh, both rental and home ownership, to try to grapple with this problem. And tomorrow on the city council, I'm co-sponsoring a hearing about payment in lieu of taxes. A lot of our hospitals and universities um, are, uh, they're, they have nonprofit status here in the city of Boston, which is depriving us of tax revenue because they don't pay taxes. And so um, there's a payment in lieu of taxes program that requires them to either pay into the city with community benefits or um, and uh, cash payments, and, and not all of them honor that. So it's those payments that can help us do the work of building more affordable housing, building more housing in general, right? We have both an affordability issue here in the city and, um, a uh, 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 construction issue. We need to be building more housing. And so we need to tackle both of that. And we're doing that on the city council alongside Mayor Wu, acknowledging the work that we need to do to keep uh, the good doctors like Dr. Moreo here um, and to make sure that uh, folks don't feel overburdened. Um, and so we're doing what we can. Of course, there's more to be done, but we're all here to do the work. Super quickly, Dr. Maria, what's the next step? 
The next step is that we are asking for MGB to work with us swiftly so that we can get to an election before the end of the academic year in June. Um, you know, right now they are engaging in some union dressing activities, sending emails, trying to, you know, discourage people um, from supporting our union efforts. And we really want to just work in good faith and get to an election quickly. Well, I thank both of you for joining us and uh, good luck to both of you. Thank you both. Thank you, Sue.